Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Pour cette dernière soirée de l'école. Good evening to you all and welcome to this last evening of à l'école de l'Anthropocène 2021, the school of the Anthropocene. In recent years, the world of aerospace has been shaken by the entry and rise of the new geopolitical players, states like China or companies like SpaceX owned by Elon Musk. The issue of regulating what's possible to do in space or not is once again at stake, whereas until now, the question question has only concerned a few public space agencies relying on partic in particular on the principles governing the activities of, of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and the other celestial bodies, a treaty ratified by the UN in 1967. The announcement by the United States of the signing of uh, the Artemis agreements by nine countries in 2020, which provide the creation of safe zones, has been analyzed by some experts. Tonight, we'll approach this theme first with an artistic investigation by Pauline Julier and Clément Postec, who staged the lives of two robotic explorers on Mars in order to make us reflect on the way we used to look at space exploration marked in particular by the myth of conquest. Then we'll hear from Alice Gorman a researcher who's interested in objects and debris in orbit and who wonders which are um, which waste uh, are um, produced and destroyed. Good evening. First of all, we want to thank Michel Dussault, Cédric Derug, and the whole team. Tonight, uh, uh, we will introduce you to our project in two parts. First, the course of the investigation, we're conducting a movie, the expedition. It's a survey we're still uh, carrying out uh, based on meetings, people, relationships that we will explain to you. Secondly, we will show you a uh, video clip that we are currently uh, writing. Everything started from an invitation that I received for uh, the biennial, uh, biennial uh, festival of uh, San Pedro de Atacama in Chile. And so I was invited to uh, work there. And when I arrived in Santiago last November, there was social rebellion against the constitution in place, because it's been in place since uh, Pinochet's di dictatorship. And so there were uh, marches and upheaval that started because of the rise of the uh, transportation fee and because uh, a young girl uh, went over the um, underground um, barriers and, that, and who was followed by, by a lot of people. So, of course, the inauguration was cancelled because it was too uh, risky in terms of infrastructures. And so then we had to go to a luxury hotel when of course, Santiago is a very urbanized um, city, and there are many popular neighborhoods that are close to very um, sh chic and, and posh uh, neighborhoods. And so we were there at this dinner, and so I had a, I was assigned a specific seat, and I was in front of the um, curator. And uh, I was with Alvaro uh, Fernandez, who is a financial director for SQM, an extra a lithium extraction uh, company in uh, Atacama Desert. And I'm really interested in this because I have an ongoing project in Atacama Desert. And so that night, I decided to interview him in order to better understand what's happening right now in the, the desert. And so then we met the following morning at Starbucks. And so he explained what was lithium, and so that's what is used for our uh, phone batteries, for our electrical bikes and electrical cars. And it's also an, an incredible component, uh, one of the main components for antidepressants. And then I realized that 
that this was something that was used to charge our batteries, even our own batteries as human beings. And so, of course, uh, the the quantity of, of lithium has soared uh, for the last 10 years. And so that's why we call it white gold and the new white gold. And so the Nobel Prize uh, um, chemistry and Nobel Prize was um, given to um, three people who uh, worked on lithium. And so the fact of extracting lithium um, is that they, they go and dig very deep and then it evaporates in um, open air. Uh, stocks, and so that's why we call it a clean extraction. 80% of the lithium is exported from Chile, and 60% uh, of the batteries are then manufactured in, in, in China. And so he reminded me that SQM um, um, is really pays attention and is very cautious with um, wildlife over there and local communities. And he also told me how um, plain and, and brown the salar is, the, the desert, salt desert. And so our interview with Alvaro finishes on Google Maps seeing uh, the mine from above. So if you can uh, go and, and have a look at this, uh, you, you will see how beautiful it is. I joined Pauline in, in the desert, uh, in the field, and we hope we can go into this extracting mine. Unfortunately, we understand we have not been taken seriously. So we give a call to Alvaro in order to get into the mine, but Alvaro is already in Barcelona. So we go back empty-handed to the village next door to San Pedro de Atacama. There we meet Karen Luza. She's the representative of the local indigenous communities. So we meet her at her place in her farmhouse on the edge of the village of San Pedro and the desert faced with the Moon Valley. She speaks about water, the element, and the legal problem of its management. She explains that water management is in the framework of the Legal Water Code 1981, one of the neoliberal reforms introduced by the military regime of Pinochet, a code that allows the state to sell water and exploitation rights to private individuals. In Chile, you can own the water without owning the land. It's a right that is given by in perpetuity to uh, the buyers. It's a liberal market logic that violently opposes local and indigenous cultures for whom water is ancestrally associated with the land. Carol tells us in particular an anecdote. One day, there's no water. She, she goes back to her farmhouse and she sees that there's no more water in the river by her farmhouse. So she has no water to uh, give to her horses or to uh, water her crops. So she goes to the hotel uh, next to her place, and she sees that there are tourists, European ones, who are just bathing in the swimming pool. So water, there is water, but uh, water that dates back to the dinosaurs is the water where tourists swim. So then Karen took a uh, decision. She decided to start um, fighting as an activist and uh, to become an indigenous leader. So she speaks about a, a sacrificed area. And in 2017, she decides, she decides to demonstrate all for the Salah, and it's uh, a message sent to the consumers, in particular consumers in North America and in Europe. Why all for the Salah? Because 
Despite what has been said, lithium extracting is mechanical, supposedly uh, natural, but it destroys the local environment. And it's Godo Fedro Benera, an architect and uh, researcher, member of forensic architecture, who explained that to us, the process for extracting lithium needs, in particular, large quantities of water from water tanks. Uh, this process also needs soda in order to accelerate the uh, evaporation process. So the water that is uh, stored in huge uh, tanks. Let's uh, water evaporate uh, thanks to the uh, sun rays. But the soda is used to speed up the reaction, and it's a pollutant. Then uh, the waste, the brine, is discharged, and they also use pumps. And in the mining chain of lithium, nothing is recycled. So it's difficult to extract uh, lithium, and there's another place where lithium can be found. And it is related to the death of some um, stars. Some people say that it's also um, easy to find on Mars, and apparently, uh, originally from the Big Bang period, there also was lithium. And so after we go back to the uh, extracting area of lithium, so it's a long road crossing, uh, going across the Salar and the village of Tukunau, where only, almost only workers live. In the Salar, we meet a uh, rover, a robot, and in, an in engineer. So we take a few minutes to speak with this engineer. His name is Steve McLaren, and he tells us why they uh, use this uh, Martian rover to test the area, because the ground in Atacama looks like the Martian soil. The Atacama desert is the closest thing on Earth uh, to Mars. And Steve, the engineer, says from Atacama soil to Martian soil, there's just one step. So Steve works at the uh, Salt Desert, and he also works in Pasadena, where rovers are steered uh, in the um, Salt Desert and also on Mars. And there are two rovers who are interesting to us. That the first one is opportunity seeking water and curiosity se seeking. Uh, life on Mars. So in France, we decide to meet Violaine Sauter, who's in charge of an international uh, team for NASA, and she's a geologist, she's a researcher, researcher, and she works for um, Curiosity, and she's in charge of a laser. And she tells us how moved she was by the first image uh, conveyed and transmitted by uh, Curiosity. Going to Mars is not so complicated, so to speak. What's really difficult is the landing, because there are seven minutes where it's really difficult and everyone holds um, their breasts. And so they were waiting for the, the ship to, to land, and then on, on JPL, they saw that Curiosity was on Mars. So how could we see then? We could see the, the shadow of the rover. We, can, we could also see the uh, margin um, ground and also Mount Sharp, and that's the objective of Curiosity. So when we listen to her, to Violaine, 
Well, actually, in fact, Mars is the twin sister of the Earth. So its ground has the same, is composed of the same um, minerals, and then there are um, plates moving, just like um, for the Earth. And she told us that we had to go that far to understand our planet's past and to go even further. Then we asked her, do you see that as a um, crystal ball? But there are many other people interested in, in, in Mars and its future and the conquest that it could represent. And one of the most famous uh, persons or people on Earth interested in this is Elon Musk, who um, is now is the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, and also worked on PayPal. And so he would like to work with NASA or complete uh, its uh, techniques. He's now the richest man on Earth. And he said that more of, of half of his wealth would be dedicated to building a city on Mars. On social networks, we saw the slogan that he used, Occupy Mars. And so Elon uh, appeared um, with this T-shirt saying Occupy Mars uh, when his daughter was born on a picture. And so the, the word used is quite striking to us. And it, you know, he's used this word from activist movements, criticizing the consequences of neoliberalism. So he's used that reference. And he grabbed it. So what does that mean, occupy, to occupy? Well, it means to occupy our imagination and take some space and open new perspectives against um, dominant narratives. And he, Ellen, Elon, um, is part of it and part of them. So. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the last thing that, that she said was to occupy Mars to defend ourselves from uh, Elon Musk. Summer 2012, uh, when we reached Mars, the American science fiction writer Ray Bradbury died. And on Twitter, Curiosity says, Ray, I dedicate my landing site on the red planet to you and give it your name. Greetings from Bradbury Landing. We could imagine that if Ray Bradbury could answer curiosity, he would read him a short story he wrote in 1947, the first of the Martian Chronicles, The Summer of the Rocket. Rocket Summer. One minute, it was a higher winter, with doors closed, windows locked, the panes blind with frost, icicles fringing every roof, children skiing on slopes, housewives lumbering like great black bears in their furs along the icy streets. And then a long wave of warmth crossed the small town, a flooding seed of hot, hot air. It seemed as if someone had left a bakery door open. The heat pulsed among the cottages and bushes and children. The icicles dropped, shattering to melt. The doors flew open, the windows flew up, the children worked off, their wall closed. The housewives shared their bare disguises. The snow dissolved and showed last summer's ancient green lawns. Rocket summer, the words passed among the people in the open, airing houses, Rocket summer, the warm desert air changing the frost patterns on the windows, erasing the artwork. The skis and sleds suddenly useless. The snow falling from the cold sky upon the town turned to a hot rain before it touched the ground. Rocket summer, people leaned from their dripping porches and watched the reddening sky. The rocket lay on the launching field, 
blowing out pink clouds of fire and oven eat. The rocket stood in the cold winter morning, making summer with every breath of his mighty of its mighty exhausts. The rocket made climates and summer lay for a brief moment upon the land.
жить и верить это замечательно перед нами небывалые пути утверждают космонавты и мечтатели что на марсе будут яблони цвести So we're back to the studios. Uh, it's an extract of the video of Pauline and Clément. And now we'll speak with Alice Gorman, who is with us. Well, she has a statement to make in French. So before giving you the floor, what time is it at your place? Oh, it's a quarter to 6 a.m. right now. Merci d'autant plus de, de So that's why we thank you even more for accepting to be live with us. So you want to say something in French before starting our discussion? Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to give an acknowledgement of country, which is something that we do in Australia at every event. Je voudrais commencer par reconnaître que je me joins à vous aujourd'hui depuis les terres du peuple Wiradjuri. 
je rends hommage aux sages du passé et du présent et je célèbre la diversité des peuples aborigènes ainsi que leur culture et lien permanent avec les terres, les eaux et le ciel d'Australie. Je salue également les gardiens traditionnels des différentes terres sur lesquelles vous regardez aujourd'hui. Merci. Merci Alice. Alors, on, Thanks a lot, on Alice. So, maybe, first of all, do you want to react after what you've heard and what you've seen? I found that film very powerful, even though it's uh, just a short part of it. And I was very struck, too, by the discussion of the process and cultural context of lithium mining particularly because uh, it relates to plans to extract resources uh, off Earth from the moon and from asteroids. And some of the resources people have their eye on are things like rare Earth elements, which are very widely used in electronic industries and uh, components of things we're just used to having now, like smartphones and computers. So if we're thinking about what we're doing in moving off Earth and into space, it's, it's very deeply entangled with terrestrial economies. And the kinds of things that we look to in space are informed by our processes and attitudes on Earth. And there's, you know, there's a very kind of utopian um, idea that we have of, of what's going to happen when we move into space. And it, in my view, you know, we're just going to get exactly the same kinds of things we have on Earth, um, particularly when some of the people driving the agendas are like uh, the space barons, like Elon Musk, who, you know, are maybe not uh, very, they're buying into old myths and stories about the earth and our relationship to space and other planets in a, maybe not a very critical way, or maybe it is critical, but that's just the position that they choose to take. So I love the excerpt of the film and I think it is, uh, you know, very important to remember that everything we do in space is deeply embedded with all of our views and experiences and hopes and dreams and fears of what happens on Earth. Merci. Alors, je disais en introduction... Thanks a lot. So, as an introduction, I said that your work deals with the issue of space objects. So, I would like to show on the screen a visualization showing the evolution of number of objects orbiting space between the 60s and the 2010s. And Alice, if possible, can you let us know about the type of object orbiting Earth? So we have the idea, I think, in the popular imagination that, that Earth is now surrounded by space junk. And this, of course, starts from 1957, the launch of Sputnik 1. And every year, the number of objects that we put into space has increased until we get to the current era and the last couple of years when the mega constellations of, of tens of thousands of satellites are being launched into Earth orbit. So we have now moved from low Earth orbit, which is the region up to about 2,000 kilometres above the surface of Earth, to geostationary orbit, 35,000 kilometres above the surface of Earth, and even higher than that, where there's a graveyard orbit where old satellites get pushed up out of the way of, of the functioning telecommunication satellites. So up there in, in this vast region, What we currently have is about 2,000 functioning satellites plus the, the many extra um, Starlink satellites that have been launched in the last couple of years. There's about 4,000 old satellites and rocket bodies, the upper stages of rockets that launch them that have been left in orbit uh, that we know about. And then we have millions and millions and millions and even more millions of fragments, 
which range in size from 10 centimetres down to nanoparticles, to tiny little bits of dust that have been created by human activity in Earth orbit. And of course, the problem is that all of this material is moving at incredibly high speeds. It's an average seven to eight kilometres a second in the low Earth orbit. And if it collides with something, then that causes both objects to lose material. Sometimes it will be little bits of stuff. Sometimes a collision can cause two spacecraft to completely fragment and disintegrate. So then we have more space junk moving at high speed, colliding with other objects. This is now such a problem for Earth that people are predicting that we might reach a situation known as the Kessler syndrome, maybe in the next 20 years, just to be pessimistic about it. The Kessler syndrome is where a self-perpetuating cascade of collisions happens, a runaway feedback effect that we will never be able to stop. The more collisions, the more fragments and the more collisions and so on. And the fears are that if we get to this stage, it will no longer be safe to launch any object into Earth orbit. And this could have a serious effect on all of the satellite services that we currently depend on. Things like telecommunications, navigation, Earth observation, weather prediction, all of those things might be put at risk. And of course, it would be very difficult for humans to go and live in orbit as they currently do on the International Space Station. So this is the situation we're at with space junk. And the entry of the mega constellations uh, just in the last few years, which are tens of thousands of smallish satellites that are put into low Earth orbit. So this is the most densely congested region of Earth orbit. We're putting more and more and more stuff up there. And we don't know what the long-term effects on the space environment are going to be. So for many, we're at a, a bit of a knife's edge or a turning point where if we don't act efficiently or fast enough, we may well find ourselves going down the path to the Kessler syndrome. Je rappelle que donc nous allons nous entretenir encore. So as a reminder, we still have 45 minutes for this uh, session, and you can ask any question on the social networks, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, of the Urban School of Lyon. One of the questions I'd like to ask you, uh, given what you've said about the situation, was this issue anticipated or uh, has it been discovered or has it been taken into account just recently? Well, the recognition that putting stuff into orbit could possibly constitute a, a problem of pollution or environmental degradation has actually been recognised since the 1970s. But of course, at that stage, there were maybe only, a, a, off the top of my head, maybe a thousand spacecraft. I don't think anybody imagined that we would get to this point so quickly where we were so reliant on space services. So people have been saying since the 1970s, we had better keep an eye on this. We had better be aware that there could be consequences. But it's only been in maybe the last decade that the, the urgency of the problem has been really recognised. And of course, the international community is very concerned about this. And there are many proposals and technologies that have um, come up in order to try and actively remove some of this debris. But the technologies are all uh, basically untested at this time. There's a couple that have had some good success, but we, we basically don't know what to do about this. What I find really interesting is the, the current paradigm used by the space community to look at the problem of space debris is called space situational awareness. And this basically means having information about all of the environmental features and threats and opportunities and factors that may prevent you from operating in space or from your spacecraft from operating in space. 
and this, of course, is, is something that we need to do. But it's interesting. Space situational awareness derives from a military concept of situational awareness. And at the, the bottom of this concept is the idea that we have to be able to act successfully or further our self-interests in space. So what space situational awareness does is kind of separate uh, the natural from the cultural. It, it puts human requirements at the middle and it regards space as a resource to be used. So when you hear people talking about sustainability in space, generally what they mean is sustainability of human use. They're not necessarily talking about uh, space as a thing in itself uh, that might require some care or management. So this is how in the space world, people are talking about the problem of space debris. And that's good. I'm not saying that isn't a really, uh, you know, positive position to, to be actively trying to do something about it. But in, in my view, uh, this is insufficient to cover what space really is. And, and I would say that space, outer space and orbital space is an environment. When you consider it as an environment rather than a situation, then a whole lot of other things come into play. So the perspective of, of an environment is that you have interconnections between processes and objects, whether those objects are made by humans or are what we could say are natural objects, cosmic rays, meteorites, all of that kind of thing. So these things are interconnected. And if you make a change to one part of this system, then it can have different effects and knock-on effects in other parts of the system. So that you have to take the space environment as an entity in itself that may have its own values and may have its own distinct character. And I think this is quite different to characterising space as a situation and the solution is always to increase the ability of humans to use space, whereas an environmental approach would look at space as something with its own values that we need to understand and that we need to curate or manage uh, to sustain it, not for our use, but for its own right, if that makes sense. Oui, nous allons revenir sur ces questions plus en avant dans l'entretien, mais peut-être pour être très concret. We'll go back later to these issues, but in order to be concrete now, what would look like an operation to take out of the orbit such debris, and would it be risky for us to bring back those objects to Earth? That's a very interesting question. So effectively, when people talk of actively removing debris from Earth orbit, it's rarely in the sense that you would capture a, an old satellite or an old rocket body and physically bring it back to the surface of Earth. So in low Earth orbit at the moment, stuff re-enters the Earth's atmosphere every day. It gets pulled in by the, the heating and cooling of the atmosphere as you know we go through day and night. The atmosphere expands. It causes bits of space junk and satellites to slow down. And the slower they get, the lower they get. And eventually, they enter the atmosphere. And the compression and friction cause them to burn up. So we do actually have a kind of a natural mechanism to get rid of space junk. It's just not working fast enough. So most proposals to actively remove debris from low Earth orbit, which is, is really the most uh, congested uh, part of space at the moment, simply involve creating a situation which will hasten that process of slowing down and getting lower and then going into the atmosphere to be burnt. So some proposals uh, involve, for example, lasers that are based on the surface of Earth that you would um, aim at a piece of space junk. This would work uh, quite well for smaller pieces. And a little piece of the junk would evaporate, alter the speed and orbit of the object, and it would get pulled back in. 
so a great proposal, but we have a big problem with this. Effectively, any mechanism you can use to remove a piece of debris from Earth orbit is also an effective anti-satellite weapon. And what happens if you just accidentally aim your laser at uh, someone else's operating satellite, uh, particularly a military satellite? We have the potential for an international incident that could have uh, very bad consequences. And it's not just lasers. Other mechanisms that have been proposed include uh, nets and sails, uh, slingshots, harpoons, uh, a whole range of things. Some of, these, some of these mechanisms are to actually catch a satellite and, you know, maybe fling it back into Earth orbit. Um, other mechanisms involve the use of, of tethers, uh, and these can be built into missions to begin with. But the aim of most of these processes are to send the piece of space junk back into the atmosphere. And now you might well ask, what does this mean for the atmosphere if so many objects, you know, made of aluminium and steel and ceramics and complicated metals and alloys and materials are burning up in the upper atmosphere, adding to, uh, to the chemical composition? Is this going to have uh, some kind of impact on the atmosphere? And the answer to that probably is right at the moment that impact would be negligible in general. But as we know, we are entering this period of accelerated activity in Earth orbit with the tens of thousands of mega constellations. So maybe that's not always going to be the case. Well, if we uh, now talk about your, your work in itself, the question you raise is how these objects gravitating in the Earth orbit should be considered as uh, waste or junk, or are they a legacy of mankind? So where does that come from um, as far as you're personally concerned? Um, so I know that you, there's an, an Aboriginal legacy uh, that mentions this. So could you please tell us a little bit more about this? And while we are um, having this discussion, I hope we'll be able to show some of the, the incredible pictures that you have uh, published. Well, I mean, I've just been talking about how we have a, a huge problem with the amount of space junk that's in Earth orbit at the moment. So paradoxically, uh, one of the main objects of my research has been to argue that we need to keep some of it in Earth orbit. So this is junk, but um, I'm an archaeologist, and what archaeologists study to understand human behaviour in the past is pretty much all of the garbage and all of the litter that people leave behind, the stuff people throw away. So when I look at junk, I'm interested in the stories it has to tell about human behaviour, and in particular in the space context, I'm interested in what this space junk can tell us about the kinds of values that we have, our attitudes and ideas about space and how those have changed over the now 60 years, more than 60 years since we sent the first spacecraft into Earth orbit. So among all of the old spacecraft that are classified as space junk and a uh, widely used definition of space junk is some object in space which isn't currently being used and doesn't have a foreseeable use in the future. So might they have cultural heritage value, some of these pieces of space junk? And I believe many of them do. When you look at some of these objects, maybe they haven't been used for 50, 20, 35 years. They're technically junk, but they're actually objects which tell a particular story about communities on Earth. And the picture you see on the screen now is actually France's first satellite, Asterix-1, launched in 1965. And this made France maybe the third or fourth nation in space for launching a satellite on its own rocket, uh, although they were launched from the Algerian launch sites. 
So that's a that's a story that speaks to the French uh, space development, as well as drawing on a popular culture reference to the the uh, character Asterix from the Bande Dessinée. And there are so many spacecraft like that. One of my favourites is an Australian one. It's called Australis Oscar 5. And it was launched in 1970 uh, by the US uh, as a, a gesture of uh, collaboration. Um, it was made by a bunch of university students who had virtually no money. They built this tiny little satellite, launched it into space, and it's still up there. So it's like a, a community science or a citizen science effort. It's also a tiny satellite, which is where we're going now. We're no longer building spacecraft that are the size of a house. Everything is becoming much smaller and miniaturized. So there's an old satellite that is part of a trajectory that's only evident to us now as we look back on, on amateur and citizen space endeavors and the growth of small sets and cube sets. Another favourite of mine is an Indonesian satellite called Palapa A1 that was launched in 1976. It was a telecommunications satellite meant to bring telephone and television to the people of Indonesia, but it was also symbolic. It was meant to, because it flew over the, the nation, which has uh, over a 1,000 islands and 3,000 languages, or maybe the other way around, but a very, very diverse nation. And the satellite was meant to be a unifying force. And it was very much regarded as that uh, by the people of Indonesia in 1976. So it's a piece of space junk now. And maybe we're not going to say, well, this is a technological advance that changed the world. But to the people of Indonesia, this piece of space junk has a huge amount of social and historic significance. So if we were in the situation, which we're not at just yet, where someone says, look, we need to get rid of some of this stuff from the sky, here's Palapa A1, not currently being used. Let's tip it back into the atmosphere to be burnt up. My argument to that would be, well, Let's not do that just yet. Let's take a step back. Let's ask about the cultural heritage value of this spacecraft. What does it mean? Are there people who would be upset if it suddenly was no longer in orbit? I can't answer that question, but the point would be that you would have to do some consultation. You would have to ask Indonesian people what they thought and what they wanted. Now, it might be that Palapa A1 is a big collision risk. It's in, in danger of saying, let's say, colliding with the International Space Station. And maybe once or twice a year, the crew inside the International Space Station have to retreat into a safe room or into the Soyuz return capsule because this piece of space junk is drawing close enough to risk colliding. And the consequences of that, you can imagine, uh, if you puncture the outside of the International Space Station, you risk depressurizing the interior and the crew would be hard put to, to, to survive that. So let's just say Palapa A1 is in an orbit where it might cross the path of the International Space Station frequently. So, okay, let's consider that risk. Maybe we do need to get rid of Palapa A1, but maybe its orbit is not providing a high risk of collision to other spacecraft. Maybe we don't have to do anything. The best way to manage the cultural heritage values of Palapa A1 are simply to leave it where it is in its natural setting, which is part of its cultural significance until such time as that risk is there. So that's kind of my argument. I would like to see orbital space approached as if it were an environment and managed in a similar way as we do on Earth, where, uh, and this used to be uh, part of my uh, professional life. I was a, a, a heritage consultant who worked in mining industry, particularly focusing on um, Indigenous or Aboriginal heritage. So, so we look at it uh, as um, part of the environmental management process. We look at what heritage values might be diminished, what heritage values we might preserve or enhance, and we make a decision 
based on full information about that process. And there are so many other spacecraft I could tell you stories about in the same way. So really what I'm advocating for is a recognition that orbital space isn't just a situation. It is now a new entity that is the combination of all of those natural environmental factors with everything that humans have done in space over the last 60 years. And we shouldn't be separating them anymore. We should be considering them as part of the same system and approach orbital debris cleanup and our future activities in, in orbit, keeping in mind that we are making actions that could change the balance of a whole lot of interconnected relationships. Si l'on prend à présent un autre cas d'étude, vous vous intéressez... Um, If we pick another uh, case study, you also focus on uh, the remains of Apollo 11. And I'd like to also say that you've, you, you're really famous for um, publishing a lot of things about it. And it's really pleasant to read your book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, that was published in 2019. It's absolutely fascinating and thrilling. And one of the cases that you've picked is this mission, Apollo 11, who landed, that landed on, on Earth. So what remains can we find on Earth, on, on the moon, sorry, still, uh, for, for Apollo 11? Thank you, Luca. So this is a fascinating site. Of course, while there's the, the main bulk of human material objects that we've sent into space are in Earth orbit, there is actually material scattered throughout the entire solar system. And the moon is the next most dense in human material. The first spacecraft were, that hit the moon was in 1959. That was the Russian Lunar 2. But probably the most famous uh, space mission of all time is Apollo 11, a US mission launched in 1969 to actually send humans to the moon. So this was the first time that any human had set foot on the surface of another world. And I think from a heritage perspective, it's, it's pretty hard to argue that that is not incredibly culturally significant. And I'm sure many of us have, have seen images and videos of the boot prints on the moon and the landing module and the famous US flag and the astronauts, you know, walking about, taking photographs of each other next to the flag. So we know a little bit about that landscape. We're, we're kind of familiar with it in a way because these pictures are so common and so famous. But it's a really interesting archaeological site. So there's over 106 objects that have been left at the site of Apollo 11 in the Sea of Tranquility. And of course, they include the descent module, which is, you know, the size of a, a room, a small room in a house. There are the flags, the flag, the boot prints. There are experiments scattered in an area around the ascent module. One of these is actually still an active experiment. It's called the lunar laser retro reflector. And there are laser beams sent, aimed towards it that are sent every day from Earth so we can get information about where the moon is. So in that sense, the site is not completely abandoned. There are experiments to measure all kinds of things, uh, lunar dust, cosmic rays, uh, the seismic activity of the moon. And as we learn more about the solar system, there's a bit many places that we've thought of as inactive or inert or dead, which are turning out to be a lot more dynamic than we ever thought. The moon is one of those. It may even have water cycles. Anyway, moving back to Apollo 11. So all of these objects, there were a whole lot of stuff from the uh, capsule that was thrown away. So it, the ascent module would be light enough to take off. So we have parts of their spacesuits. We also have bags of human waste. So these are quite interesting because if we could retrieve them for analysis, we would learn something about how human molecules react to the space environment. 
So all of that stuff is there, all of this incredible technology, all of this evidence of a very particular phase of, of the history of our engagement with space. Because, of course, the US sent people to the moon for a mere six years and then nobody has been back since. No one has been to the moon since 1972. So all of that, I think it would be fairly easy to say there's a lot of cultural heritage value going on there. But something that started to intrigue me the more I investigated the Apollo 11 landing site, and I can't really remember anymore what kind of sparked this train of thought off. I was looking at photographs because that's the record we have of, of these surface missions. And there's many photographs in which you see an astronaut taking the photograph, but they're not in the frame. What you see is this long elongated shadow, um, which to me, the more I looked at these shadows, the more I thought, well, they, they kind of look a bit lonely. They're kind of like, um, they give you a feeling of sort of melancholy and sadness, particularly, I guess, because the shadow is frozen in that photograph, but both the shadow and the person that cast it have long since left the moon. So I started thinking about the shadow environment of Apollo 11 and, and all of the lunar sites really. So if you think about the moon, which was, was formed uh, something like um, 3.8 billion years ago, I know that's not quite right, but that's the ballpark figure. In all of this time, the shadows that have been cast by the movement of the sun across the surface have been shadows of crater walls, rocks and boulders, mountain ranges. They've been that sort of fractal, organic or a mineral or geological kind of appearance, aesthetic. But when humans went to the moon, they left behind objects which cast very different shadows. These shadows were linear and sharp, and sometimes they were textured because there were antennas, for example, which had wire meshes on them. And so they cast a sort of a lacy um, shadow that looked a bit like a, a sea creature on the surface of the moon. So this is a radical departure for the appearance of the moon. And these shadows are not, these shadows are part of the landscape. So, so the sun takes a fortnight uh, to move across the surface of the moon in the daytime. And as it moves, these shadows move as well. So they're, they're dynamic, they're not static. And even more than that, lunar dust is very uh, sticky and um, turbulent and the, because it's, it's electrostatically charged. So when light passes over it, it actually levitates, it rises above the ground. So what I think is happening right now at Apollo 11 and all of these other sites with all their complex corners and nooks and crannies is that the passage of the day creates these little dust maelstroms inside all the bits of the equipment uh, that are like little micro environments like we might have on, on earth as well in any structure or building. So this again, this is a, a distinct ecological, geological phenomenon on the surface of the earth that's been created by the interaction of these human artifacts with the lunar environment. And I think this is something that is interesting in its own right. We haven't just put stuff on the surface of the moon, stuff which you may, could just remove and leave the moon in the same situation it was before. This stuff is now part of the environment of the moon. And it's also beautiful in its own way. The, the shadows that are cast by these human objects have their own distinct feeling. And for me, the, the feeling was, was, you know, this, this slightly sad reaction of, of, of seeing the astronaut shadows, which are no longer there, but we have a human emotional reaction to these places. It's not all about cold, hard technology. It is actually also about the feelings that they evoke for a whole range of different reasons. I think that's really important to recognize.
Et alors, si, si l'on vous suit dans votre réflexion, so, qui pourrait avoir la if we follow you in your uh, reasoning, who could protect, who could manage these heritage countries, companies, uh, people uh, who have uh, cast uh, objects out of the uh, earth space, or should it be uh, a multinational, a supranational institution? A really good question. So if we acknowledge that there is cultural heritage value in some of these places and objects, and a very important part of that is, is value to people and communities. It's, it's really all about our, our social engagement with these places. And if we want to keep some of it into the future, and I don't want to close any avenues off or predict or what people in the future might think. But we, we kind of have to make decisions now for what survives into the future. They might be very imperfect, but if we don't do that, then there won't, might not be anything in the future. So, so how do we do that? On Earth, we have very well-established processes. There are charters and conventions. And, you know, we, we still have, I guess, a lot of contention around heritage on Earth but it's recognized and there are legal and um, uh, regulatory ways to try and preserve it. So we don't have that situation in space. One of the reasons for that is because the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, a treaty that I'm, I'm very much in support of, says that there can be no territorial claim in space. So if you were to say, well, this object or place on the moon or another planet uh, comes under the heritage law of our country that is equivalent to making a territorial claim, even though it's done with the best intention um, and in a very uh, benign way. So we can't use national heritage legislation or even the World Heritage Convention to apply to places in space. So we really do need some kind of multilateral international regime that takes account of heritage. And this fits quite well with the current dialogue around the sustainability of space. So, so heritage is part of that sustainability as well. But we sort of, you know, we need a lot more work, I think, to kind of get uh, everyone on the same page with this. It's very promising at the moment because the Artemis Accords that the US uh, released last year, uh, or maybe it was 2019, explicitly identify heritage on the moon as something important that needs to be uh, taken into account and needs to be preserved. So that's a very positive move. There's also two international documents that talk about cultural and natural heritage as important facets of the space environment. Uh, one is the Hague building blocks that were released in late 2019, which focus on sustainable use of space. And then the Vancouver recommendations on space mining, which were released in April, 2020. So heritage is getting higher profile, but what we really need, the, the base of all good heritage management is information, is having the right information to make good decisions. And what this means we have to do is do a proper significance assessment of all of the things that we have in space. This is something that could be done at a national level. And then that has to be accessible to people making decisions somehow. I think there's a couple of ways we could do this. The United Nations maintains a register of every object launched into space. So that already exists and it wouldn't be too difficult to add heritage information into that. So you could just look that up. There's also massive catalogues of tracked debris in low earth orbit. And tracked debris is the stuff we know where it, where it is which isn't, isn't everything at all. It's only a, a portion of what's up there, but there's a number of these catalogs. And again, we could add that heritage information in there. So basically we'd get to a situation where 
we had the right kind of information for people to make decisions. So that would be a great first step. Probably we also need some kind of space heritage charter or convention. That would be very, very useful. And the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, would, would be a good uh, organisation to promote that. So I would say we're kind of at the beginning of this process. Some of my work has been to raise awareness of the fact that space junk, uh, the litter that we've left throughout the solar system is far more than that. It's something that speaks to our space history and speaks to communities on Earth. So just the recognition that we have cultural heritage in space, I think is really important. Now what we need is mechanisms to make sure that future generations get to have their own choices and have their own feelings and attachments to these extraordinary places. Oui, et, et pour rebondir sur ce que vous disiez... Definitely, and you know, reacting after what you've said, one of your uh, uh, lines of work is to take them out of the mere technological history and the traditional value that are associated with them, uh, conquest, colonization. So how could we write an alternative history of these uh, space objects and take them out of the mere values uh, of history and that have much more values than that? Yes, we, we, there's a very widely known story of, of the space race and a, a kind of a narrative which, which is all about um, space as, uh, you know, a new frontier and humans are going to go out and conquer space and, you know, everything is going to be very sort of utopian and rosy. And in this narrative, uh, which, you know, you will see in, in, in popular depictions of space, you know, films and articles and television series, all of those things, you know, it's very... Uh, it's a very clear and easy story. So, so, you know, all these different nations have sent things into space on behalf of all of humanity and they represent all of humanity. And, it, you know, that's a nice story, but unfortunately it's, it's not the whole story by, by any means. The people who have gone into space so far have tended to be wealthy, white, industrial nations, what, you know, used to be called the first world. And they've often done that, been able to go into space because um, many of these nations had colonies where they could locate things like rocket launch ranges, which are, you know, very dangerous places. Rockets explode all the time. Even now, even Elon Musk's rockets are still uh, successful 100% of the time. So the early spacefaring nations, as we call them, were only able to develop their spacefaring capability because they had colonies. So in Britain's case, it was Australia. In France's case, it was Algeria and French Guiana. And I, I'm lucky enough to have visited Kourou, which uh, was you know, an incredible experience for me. So these are amazing places in their own right, but we have to acknowledge that they were located there because of low populations caused by colonial genocide. So that's part of the space story. It's one that you don't often hear as part of that space race narrative or the idea that, that all of humanity participates in space. Historically, there have been groups of people who were actively excluded from any participation in space. In, in Australia at the Woomera rocket launch range, this is on the traditional lands of the Kukuta, Pitjantjatjara, and a range of different other traditional owner groups. They didn't get to have a space age because in that way of viewing the world, they were too um, primitive. Um, hopefully you could see that, so I'm using that word advisedly. So the whole concept of humanity going into space itself is, is deeply problematic in my view. Only certain types of people get to count as humanity in this concept. So I think heritage is interesting in this respect because we have to look at how 
objects relate to community values and community histories. And in this process, we get to reflect on who gets left out, who was protesting a certain space development at the time. And so it's it's fairly well known, known now, I think, that um, African-American communities uh, led a vigorous protest movement against the Apollo missions, which were, they rightly saw as using up resources that uh, could be maybe better allocated to reducing social and economic uh, inequality in the US. And this is a story you'll see in, in many places, um, even in French Guiana. So in fact, these easy narratives are are deeply fractured and in the process of looking at the heritage of these places, like, like my job and our job as heritage managers isn't to present the dominant authoritative narrative. Our job is to look at what these places really do mean for people and it's not always positive. And there are many people who've been adversely impacted by space and space technology. This stuff is equally part of our space age heritage. And I think taking this perspective allows us to have a clearer view of what it is we're going into in the future. So this isn't just about the past. This is about the stories that we tell into the future. And it can be the basis of political action as well. Definitely, and in your work for deconstructing the spatial era, you are interested in toponymy, the places and names of objects in space. Yes, I mean, that's not material culture as such, but it's intangible heritage. So, you know, when humans go to space, we have to name things. So we know what we're talking about. And also is it a process of sort of forming connections to them. So um, I mentioned Asterix 1, France's first satellite. So that obviously was, was called Asterix 1. I think its original name was A41. It was a numbers, alphanumeric. But giving it the name Asterix 1 uh, was something that, that tapped into much deeper and broader uh, stories of French cultural identity. And we see a similar thing with the naming of spacecraft and the naming of places um, on other planets and moons throughout the solar system. So if you follow any of the recent space missions, something you'll have observed is as, as a spacecraft passes over um, uh, you know, an asteroid or a comet or a moon, uh, it will document and map the surface and then features on the surface will be given new names. And the naming process is actually the responsibility of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, often in this process, uh, scientists will give informal names to features uh, in the beginning and then these are kind of ratified by the International Astronomical Union. Each planet has a theme for naming and uh, the International Astronomical Union has been making a real effort to be, to cast a wider net with these names. So, so the names aren't all of, you know, Western scientists. Uh, they're trying to be more inclusive and include more indigenous names as well. So a little while ago, I decided to find out how many Aboriginal place names there were in the solar system. And it turns out there's 0.03% of every named feature across all of the nine planets, I'm including Pluto, and all of the moons and asteroids that we know of, 0.03% of those are uh, uh, Australian Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander words. And the, the, they're often words that are drawing on uh, very deep cultural beliefs. So we might know some of the stories about them. Uh, and in fact, you can go to the International Astronomical Union's website and you can find the, the books and the sources that they use to get these names. But these will always be the outward story. So in um, Aboriginal knowledge systems, there, there are hierarchies of information that you are allowed access to, depending on your place within that society and, and 
uh, the, the sort of degree of, of, of initiation or um, experience you might have. So, so I'm never going to know some of these stories and no one in the International Astronomical Union is going to know some of these stories. That's knowledge that's not for us. But these names still exist. There's uh, some on Pluto. There's some on Venus. The, the naming theme of Venus is, is female deities. So there are some very significant... Um, Aboriginal um, creation deities um, that are represented on Venus. And some of the names are landscapes on Earth as well, landscapes which have tremendous significance, particularly in relation to um, movement of, of the living uh, between life and death. And now these are in the solar system. They're on other planets. They're on other moons. What does this mean? And, again, it's, it's not for me to say what it means, but it, it surely means something because these names are not just words. They're, they're meaningful in, in sort of deep cultural ways. And I think it's really interesting that uh, the, the sort of outward purpose of naming places in the solar system is firstly so scientists can know they're talking about the same thing, which is, is fairly necessary. And it's surprising, you know, in the old days, the amount of duplication of names there were across all of these planets. It's, it's also about a process of world building, of, of creating connections between our experience and these otherworldly places. But I think looking at, you know, my very brief study of how many Aboriginal place names there were in the solar system, there's much deeper cultural resonances as well. And, and maybe again, also, I don't know, but for some uh, Indigenous groups, the presence of that name, even though they didn't necessarily have a say in it, uh, creates a connection that again requires action. It, it maybe sets up a relationship of responsibility. And that I think is, is perhaps something we need more of across the board anyway. Maybe making these human connections to places outside Earth isn't just making these unfamiliar places familiar to us. It is something that can be used to spur moral obligations and deepen our, our ethical engagement with the rest of the solar system. Notre entretien touche à sa fin. J'aurais simplement aimé... Well, I think we're, we've come to um, the end of um, our interview. I'd like you to comment on this uh, Artemis agreement because it might lead to um, uh, land ownership in, in space. And you were uh, mentioning that there were encouraging uh, elements in terms of, of legacy. And I'd like to know what your take is on this and this agreement that was initiated by the United United States and nine other countries. Yes, I'm, I'm in two minds about the Artemis Accords. They very much represent an approach of, of bilateralism to activities in space rather than the multilateralism that has been uh, a cornerstone of, of our United Nations um, structure for dealing with space. I think the idea is to, part of the idea, and I may be very cynical about this, and I know many people would disagree with me, I think part of the rationale for the Artemis Accords uh, is to um, prevent the formation of much stronger multilateral agreements about what we do in space. And, of course, that's the direction that things like the Hague building blocks and the Vancouver recommendations are coming from. I mean, I'm pleased that heritage is included, but many people are saying that the idea of safety zones is a kind of a backdoor way to open the moon up to a territorial claim. And that seems a bit in uh, opposition to the US's very strongly stated commitment to the Outer Space Treaty, but we do note that they have repudiated the moon agreement. They have, it's not just that they haven't signed or ratified the moon agreement of 1976 they have sort of actively, with the Artemis Accords, they're, they're very actively rejecting uh, any of its principles. Um, so I guess I wouldn't be surprised if 
the idea of the safety zones um, does morph into some kind of territorial claim in the future. And to my mind, um, there's an interesting intersection with lunar cultural heritage here. So we know on Earth if, if somebody uh, wishes to destroy the claims of another group to, to have rights to land or um, political autonomy, they often attack cultural heritage first. And there have been some very high-profile examples of this, for example, um, the, the Bamiyan Buddhas. Um, so, so we know, so heritage is intensely political and can be weaponized. So we know that the US uh, has a, a lot of cultural heritage on the moon, but it's not the only nation. There's also a lot of USSR and Russian heritage. Other nations who have cultural heritage material on the moon include India, Japan, China, Israel, and there's likely to be more. So if you were going to try and make a claim that, you know, you had rights to a certain area of the moon, heritage might be one way you would go about reinforcing that. So the US is very keen to protect its cultural heritage sites, and I fully applaud and support that, but it would be naive to imagine that there are not some broader political aims as well. What if the US lunar heritage sites are protected but there's an active uh, program to, say, remove the earlier Russian sites. And remember, Russia was the first nation to reach the moon in 1959. And it's so far away, we can't see everything that's going on on the surface. Heritage protection would be very difficult to enforce. It could be a matter of, oh, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, too late now. So I think we should be looking at how heritage might not be just an added extra to things like the Artemis Accords. It might actually be something that's co-opted to support certain political um, claims to have primacy on somewhere like the moon. This is how heritage has operated on Earth. And this is certainly how it might go in space. And from that perspective, again, having as much knowledge out there in the public domain about what these places are and what the heritage values are, I think is really important. So I guess you could say I am quite cynical about where the Artemis Accords are going to lead. And Australia, of course, is one of those nine signatories. But from my perspective, I guess I'm going to be uh, looking at the cultural heritage aspects and seeing how they are used and how they intersect with future plans to go to the moon and hoping that um, they can be used as a way to, to promote um, harmony rather than discord in our future space activities. Alice Gorman, merci beaucoup pour ce passionnant entretien et je, je vous invite... Alice Gorman, thank you so much for this fascinating interview and I'd like to uh, ask you to stay for, for the last word by Michel Lusso of this uh, festival of the Anthropocene who's now going to join us on set. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Thanks a lot, um, Alice. We're very proud, very honored to have you with us and Lucas really wanted to interview you because he's a big fan of yours and uh, he's worked a lot uh, to make the most of this interview and I think it's a, it's a sign that we end up this festival uh, assessing the situation of planet Earth and the space because it's in re direct relation with, uh, because space is in direct relation with what happens on Earth. So thanks a lot for participating in this festival. I know it's very early there. And I... Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. It has been my absolute pleasure to be part of this festival.
Merci, merci Alice Gorman et bonne journée à vous. Thank you, thank you very much and uh, have a nice day because your uh, day is just starting. I also want to take advantage of the fact that I've got the microphone to conclude this festival. We started broadcasting at 11 o'clock a.m. Monday. We've offered you more than 130 uh, programs, sometimes until uh, 23.45, 11.45 p.m., um, even 2 o'clock in the morning, many of you uh, have uh, watched us online on YouTube. I know that also the uh, podcasts have already been uh, watched uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, on Facebook. A lot of people uh, make comments. So uh, our purpose was to produce uh, resources for you in order for you to understand how uh, currently science helps us understand uh, this Anthropocene era, uh, how to think of Earth, its habitability, and the way we can invent uh, the future for this planet. Although that there are uh, reasons for being pessimistic, we want to be optimistic. I hope you have found these uh, debates interesting. Of course, nothing would have been possible without uh, people working backstage. Uh, people I want uh, to introduce you to, first of all, the uh, fantastic team of the Urban School. We have organized this unique event in France, but now uh, follow me backstage in order to meet some people who have helped this festival to be a success. Hello. First of all, hello to the interpreters. Thank you for helping us to uh, organize this festival. Sometimes it was a bit challenging, but uh, thank you very much for uh, keeping with us. We believe in multi lingual programs. Umberto Eco used to say that the language of Europe is translation, and I think that the uh, language of science is also multilingual. Also, I want to introduce you to our technicians. This is our great technical team. Uh, this uh, Streaming studio, uh, Octopus October. Uh, it's a bit like a spaceship, I think. Don't you think so, Alice? You see all these lights and machines. This is a studio for the sound, the light. Uh, thanks to them, uh, we could see the performance of the Frank Michelotti company. There you have the October Octopus team. This is the uh, program agency. Here we've got the person in charge of the building, Hotel 71, where we were, uh, we've been broadca broadcasting from. And there it is. Uh, I cannot show you around the whole building. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for following us. Many people have been with us. And be sure to uh, be uh, here again in 2022. See you soon. Talk to you soon from the Urban School of Lyon. Merci Alice, au revoir. Oh, merci. Uh, merci bien. Um, I'll talk to you soon.